So here's a prayer. I don't know if you know this. If you do join in, um, my mother taught it to me. So in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Um, well, so welcome. And this is going to be a class on Mary. Um, and it's also, for me, uh, not just, it's kind of a scripture class, because we're going to stick with scripture. And it's also an apologetic class. Uh, Apologize, because I really do want people to fall in love with Mary, and I actually pray that I will love Mary the way Jesus did, which is, of course, impossible, but I, I want other people to fall in love with Mary, um, which reminds me of an uh, old joke um, <laughs> about this uh, newly ordained priest who, um, when he gives a homily, he starts giving a homily, and he gets so nervous that people are looking at him. He gets flustered and can't remember where he is. And then he drones on and people start to fall asleep and people get bored. So he tells the bishop because he's got complaints that his homily is boring. So the bishop talks to him and says, you know, you know what I do is that when people start to fall asleep, I throw out a zinger and wake them up. Um, like I'll say, I'm in love and I'm in love with a beautiful woman. And she's married. And at that point, they're paying attention. And <laughs> then I'll say, and it's the Virgin Mary. So the young priest decides, OK, I'll give it a shot. So he's given a homily and gets really nervous, starts to lose his place and drone on. And so uh, he sees people are falling asleep. So he says, the bishop is in love. <laughs> he's in love with a beautiful woman. And now everybody's paying attention. <laughs> And he says, and she's married. And now he starts to get nervous because they're looking at him. He says, and I forget her name. <laughs> but uh, I know, I think that's a great joke. Anyhow, um, so really, like, uh, this sounds kind of strange. A lot of people, even a lot of Catholics, Think like these titles that we give Mary, uh, Mother of God, Queen of Heaven. Um, all these titles are just things that were made up in the Middle Ages. They're actually not. They're, f they're part of actually Judaism that we've inherited. And if you don't know those titles, and then really uh, they all come from the Bible. So just an overview of this class, what I'm going to do is um, it's three classes. So this class is going to be on... Mary is the new Eve. The next class will be Mary, uh, the new Ark. And the third class is going to be a lot. It's going to be uh, Mary, mother, queen, and warrior, um, which are all in the Bible. But the problem is, just starting off this, is that there's kind of this, uh, among Protestants, some anti-Catholic history. You know, where Protestants will say, you Catholics worship Mary. Or they'll say, Mary had no free choice. She's just a, a woman. Um, she's just a woman. You guys make a big deal about it. Um, then why did she say, let it be done according to your will, if she didn't choose it? And no other person was at, asked to give flesh to God. Uh, so why wouldn't you honor her? Um, so Mary is this big dividing line between Christians. Um, and some ir serious issues have evolved. And the problem is, is that I think a lot of Catholics don't know their Bible. So when they say, why do you guys worship Mary? Um, you can't give an answer. Or why do you call Mary Queen of Heaven? Why do you call Mary uh, Mother? Uh, well, the problem is, is, if you know your Bible, you can answer that. And if the Protestants are right, um, that Catholics and Orthodox Christians are wrong, um, that praying to Mary is idolatry, uh, we've been doing it for 2,000 years. If they're right, we're going to be damned. If Catholics and Orthodox are right that about Mary, then Protestants who say that you have to take the Word of God serious, then they're the ones who aren't taking the Word of God serious. So I want to study Mary um, by using the Bible and discover why she's more 
than just the mother of God. Why ancient Christians called her, quote unquote, the mother of all the living. Um, so, like, I hope you can defend Mariology and actually in this class maybe fall in love with her a little bit more. Um, and most importantly, whatever we say about Mary, it's actually saying something about Jesus. Uh, the more important we make Mary, the more important we make Christ. But to study kind of, oh, well, first of all, when people say, will you pray to Mary? Just real quick, I'm only going to give it like a 30 seconds on this. No, um, we believe in the communion of saints. In the same way I can ask you to pray for me, which I hope you do, uh, why can't I ask Mary? Literally in the Bible, it says that the saints in heaven, they're praying for us. In the Bible, it says the prayers of a righteous are powerful. And we believe Mary is the holiest of all the human race. So why wouldn't her prayers be um, helpful? And we don't pray to Mary, we pray with Mary. Um, and the word pray, by the way, doesn't necessarily mean worship. The word pray means really ask. Like if I said, pray tell, Audrey, how many beers did you have this morning? Um, <laughs> It's, I'm not praying to Audrey. Uh, prayer is just ask. And the problem is in English, you just have this one word. In Latin, you have other words um, for worship, for honor. We honor Mary. We don't worship Mary. That's a completely different word. Um, so, but to understand the role of Mary and why we uh, say Mary, you have to be able to study scripture. So. Here's a very, the ancient way of studying scripture is called typology. And so I actually I'm going to probably spend a couple minutes on that. So where we get our theology of Mary is through interpreting the scriptures through typology. Um, we do this with the Old Testament and New Testament. Ancient Christians did it. Um, and typology is about types. That you find types in the Old Testament that are fulfilled in the New Testament. Um, so, like, it literally says, Jesus is a new Adam. Um, Jesus is a new Adam, a new Moses, a new David. Um, so that's typology. Does that make sense? Like, uh, uh, Jesus is a new Adam, a new being. Uh, he's a new David, the king. Uh, but he's greater. So the types in the Old Testament, David, uh, Moses, Noah, we'd say they're fulfilled in Christ, but Christ is much bigger. What's ever in the Old Testament, it's more honored in the New Testament. And you have all these types, such as the Eucharist. Um, hopefully you know this, but there's all these prefigurements of the Eucharist. Uh, the Tree of Life, the um, uh, Passover, the Lechem Ha Panin, the Face of God. Now, all the sacrifices, they're fulfilled and point to the Eucharist. Um, hopefully you know that. Um, trees, I know this is going to sound strange, trees are really important in the Bible. The Bible begins with the tree of life and it ends with the tree of life. Um, and in the Bible, now I'm just going off, like the typology is this. In, in the Garden of Eden, there's two trees, right? In the center of the garden is the tree of life. And all you have to do to eat from the tree, like God says, you can eat from all the trees of the garden, um, but don't eat from the tree of good. And in English, it says selfishness or evil, but it's actually selfish. Um, don't eat from that tree. So human beings, they can eat from all the tree. But if you eat from the tree of life, I don't want to get too much into this. The tree of life has God's own life in it. Uh, so it's more than just the other fruits. The other fruits will keep you physically alive. The tree of life will give you spiritual life. And all you have to do to eat from this tree is deny yourself a little bit and walk by the tree of good and selfishness. Just die to a little of selfishness and you can eat the fruit from the tree of life. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, okay, so if you notice, that just doesn't end in the Garden of Eden. All through the Bible, you have this concept of two trees. The word in Hebrew for wood and tree in ancient Hebrew is the exact same word. So you keep finding these two trees, and it means two choices. In Noah, you have two trees. 
In Moses, you have two trees. In David, he makes a sacrifice to God in one tree. Uh, another tree symbolizes death. Uh, Abraham, you have two trees. It keeps com coming up all over the place. You just have to start noticing it. Like um, uh, uh, Isaac, when he's 33 years old, Isaac, when he's going to be sacrificed, he's 33 years old. He's not a little kid. And he carries the tree, the wood of the cross. Um, he's 33 years old. Um, and then he doesn't die. He actually lives. Um, you know the story, right? And then there's a, a ram who has his head caught in a tree, uh, thorns in a tree is what it really says. So once again, there's two trees. And the one that dies is the ram. Let's say, well, really, Christ is the fulfillment of uh, Isaac's sacrifice. He's sacrificed in uh, the same place that Christ is sacrificed. Christ also carried the wood, the tree, um, it keeps coming up again and again. Um, or like a, um, uh, the story of Joseph. Joseph is, once again, guess how old Joseph is when he uh, ascends to the right hand of the king of Egypt? 33. It's Joseph who uh, his 12, the, his brothers tried to kill. But it's Joseph who ends up, even though left for dead, um, rises up and becomes the right hand and then feeds the world. Everybody, you know, we'd say, well, that's just a prefigurement, a type of Christ. At the end, I forgot to mention this, in the end, there's the Garden of Eden, and that, uh, sorry, at the Book of Revelation, there's paradise, once again, the Tree of Life, um, and we get to eat from the Tree of Life. When, what, when do you eat from the Tree of Life? Yeah, uh, the fruit of the Tree of Life. So that's typology, does that make sense? Well, the same way there is with the Eucharist, with the cross, with uh, Christ, there's also, you can study the Old Testament using typology of Mary. To understand Mary, first, you have to look at her through a very Jewish context. And over and over, the books about Mary uh, that are critical of Catholic belief totally ignore Scripture themselves. It says nothing about the ancient Jewish uh, prophecies about the Messiah and the mother of the Messiah. So if you're going to really understand what the Bible is teaching about Mary, you can't just study the New Testament alone. That's not enough. You have to go back to the Old Testament and try and see Mary and, and Jesus through Old Testament eyes. So um, one would be the New Eve. Now, I just want to uh, use one more example of a typology. Okay, first. And this will give me time to buy the donut. Um, <laughs> is typology clear that there's a prefigurement in the Old Testament, fulfillment in the New Testament? Anybody lost on that? Okay, so I'll give you an example, and this will be key. So um, the creation story. Just in case you didn't know, there's not one, there's two. One is from the northern tribes, one is from the southern tribes. And... Um, Actually, I was um, at dinner with, I don't want to say who, it was your daughter-in-law. Um, <laughs> and I was kind of like, this was such a nice compliment because her daughter-in-law is not Catholic um, by any stretch of the imagination, <laughs> but she's a very good person. And we're having drinks. I'm not, they're drinking. Uh, but um, <laughs> anyhow. Uh, Do you have to go to confession now? Oh, no. <laughs> okay. Now I have to go and explain something. Um, I'm Irish, so like there's this movie I love called Da. It's this uh, guy, it's an Irish movie where this guy is constantly arguing with his dad. And he finds out that his dad lied to him, that he was adopted. Um, and he's furious, and he's yelling at his dad, and he says, You lied to me! You lied to me! My entire life, you've lied to me! And his dad says, Well, no, I wouldn't call that a lie. And he says, Well, wait! What do you call that? That's a lie. And he says, well, I call it to make yuppie. <laughs> so, <laughs> I have a lot of make yuppies. Um, but, and I forget how one of the boys had something to do with um, a Bible story, and they mentioned uh, the Adam and Eve story, and he said, well, that's, that's not what it really means. So the northern tribes, their creation story, God creates all humanity all at once. 
The southern tribes, they had a different story where God creates a single human being. And what's really interesting, if you read it in Hebrew, you don't know if it's male or female. All it keeps saying is um, ha-adam, God scooped up. Ha-adama, um, adama means the earth, uh, scooped up ha-adaman and made ha-adam, the earthling. So it, but if I said the earthling, you don't know if I mean male or female. And uh, the earthling knows everything can name everything, um, all this other stuff. Um, the earthling has vast real estate holdings, so he has everything you think that would make life great. Knowledge, land, wealth, gold, he has the entire earth, but it's not enough. And he actually, in Hebrew, prays for a savior. Uh, and God puts him to death. In English, we'll clean it up and say sleep. He puts him to death. And the word for rib, and the word for side is the exact same word in Hebrew. So did he split the atom or um, just take the rib? And the Jews would say, no, we translate it rib because if God would have taken a bone from man's head, man would try and dominate woman. If God would have taken a bone from man's foot, woman would try and dominate, I got that back, um, woman would try and dominate man. But if he takes a bone closest to the heart, you'll realize that you're incomplete without somebody to love. And so um, the idea there is that the split side in Judaism, to have your side split in death, is a sign of unconditional love. You, uh, so after that, when he has his side split, that's when there's community. He gives birth to Eve out of death. And after that, God stops calling them uh, ha Adam and starts calling them human beings. So the point being is that you're born an earthling and it's only when you know love to the point of death that your true humanity is born. So Christ on the cross, the early Christians would say, oh, it's the Adam and Eve story. And if you think like plot wise, well, what do you mean? There's not an Eve with Jesus. Well, think about this. Jesus goes on the cross, is willing to have his side split open and die, and what is born is relationship. Um, does that make sense? Oh, what's born is this marriage between us and, and Christ, the same way Adam and Eve. So we'd say, oh no, oh, the story of the cross, it's the Adam and Eve story, if you think in terms of typology. Does that make sense? Um, so back to the dinner. So I explained that, and her daughter-in-law says, that's the most beautiful explanation I've ever seen. But see, people think that they know the story because they can think in terms of, I know the plot. But typology is what's going on. If you think typology, you can say, oh, the uh, Adam and Eve story is really the story of the cross. Uh, the story of Joseph being 33 years old, ah, it's fulfilled in the life of Christ. Does that make sense? And when when he rises, God calls them human beings. There's actually four different words to call a, a person. You could call him, uh, I could call you Hadam, the earthling, or I could call you a human being. How you say that in Hebrew is Ish or Isha. Um, it doesn't translate that well in English. So how you say human being is a male would be uh, Ish. Uh, a female is Isha. So sometimes they'll translate uh, the word Isha as woman. That's true, it is, but it's actually a female human being in the sense of a true human being. Isha or Isha you use because it means you're in relationship with somebody else. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. If I wanted to just speak about you as a solitary being, I would have said Ha Adam. Um, if I want to speak about you as being fully alive in relationship with others, you would use the term Isha or Isha. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's part of the Adam and Eve story, and that's going to be very important when you get to Mary, because um, this class will be called, we're just going to go over Mary as the new Eve. And the problem is when a lot of people study the gospel um, and talk about the good news of salvation, Unfortunately, Protestants, and I've spoken with Protestants, and they'll say, oh, the, when they say the word the gospel, 
they mean that my personal sins have been forgiven. Um, they mean I'm forgiven and I go to heaven. We Catholics would say, well, that's a very limited definition of the gospel. The gospel is much more than that. It's about the forgiveness of all sins, clear back to the very first sin, the sin of Adam and Eve, uh, in which death and suffering came into the world. So according to the New Testament, it calls Jesus the new Adam, where obedience undoes the disobedience of the first Adam. So Jesus is the new Adam. Um, Nowhere is expressed more clearly than in the writings of St. Paul when he talks about Adam and Jesus. Just read this. As, and he's talking about Adam and Jesus. So, As one man's trespasses led to condemnation for all, so one man's act of righteousness leads to the acquittal and life for all. For as by one man's disobedience we were made sinners, so by one man's obedience we have been made righteous. He's comparing Adam and Jesus as the new Adam. Or he says, the first Adam became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. The first Adam was made from the earth, a man of dust. The second Adam is made from heaven, or sorry, is from heaven. So St. Paul calls him the last Adam. Jesus is the last Adam, the new Adam, then salvation is not just about sinners avoiding the fires of hell. It's about undoing the very effects of the fall of Adam and Eve. It's about restoring us and creation back to its original righteousness. Righteousness means right relationship, which Adam, when he was created, he lost through disobedience. So the power of God's grace actually makes us human beings become righteous. That's what he says in Romans. Um, so you say, well, what does that have to do with Mary? The answer is simple. If Jesus is the new Adam, who is the new Eve? According to the book of Genesis, Adam is not the only human being created uh, by God in the Garden of Eden. Adam doesn't bring in sin and death into the world alone. He has a partner. Um, Eve plays the role of the person who brings about the fall of humanity. So when you're talking about the Adam and Eve story, just a couple things you have to know. One, Adam and Eve were created, quote unquote, very good. So according to the Jewish Bible, God creates the first man and the first woman in the state of moral goodness, and Adam and Eve are created in God's image and likeness. Uh, they're created very good. Now, here's the odd part. If you study the verbs, like we don't have it in English, it is in Spanish. So in Spanish, like I can say, um, uh, uh, caliente is hot, right? And then soy means I am. Estoy also means I am. But if I use the word estoy, it means transitory. Does that make sense? So if I said estoy caliente, it means I'm hot right now, but when I go outside, I'll be estoy frío. I'll be cold. Does that make sense? If I say soy, it means a permanent condition. So if I say soy caliente, I'm hot, it means <laughs> I am hot. Um, so, so, and why that's important is when God creates the universe, he, and he says, um, it is good. The is that he uses is permanent. So is a tree good? Yes, a tree is good and will always be good. Fulfilling its purpose. Is a dog good? Yes. Is a human being? A human being is very good, but the is that's used is transitory. We are created to be very good, but there is a choice. Um, so anyhow, um, the Lord commanded the man saying, you may freely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For the day you eat it, you shall die. Then the Lord caused a deep sleep upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed it up with flesh. And the rib, which the Lord your God had taken from the, the Adam, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called Isha, 
because she was taken out of man. Um, Adam and Eve are created in God's image and likeness, and they were created very good, without sin. So if I said, who are the first people created without sin? Hopefully you wouldn't say Mary and Jesus. You would say Adam and Eve. Um, God said that they may eat freely of the garden, which includes the tree of life. Um, the other fruit of the garden, they could, could give them life and sustain them physically, but the tree of life food gives them eternal life. Also note that before the fall, um, this is kind of interesting. Eve is never called Eve until after they're kicked out of the garden. That's kind of, don't you think that's kind of interesting? She's simply called Isha, woman. And when I say woman, I don't mean female. I mean Isha, uh, true human being. So if you keep um, reading, it's only after they've sinned that names come into play. In the Garden of Eden, there are no names. Also, just by the way, in the Garden of Eden, there's also no children. So in paradise, there's no children is what I mean. Um, just kidding. But so that's the first thing. Created very good. Second, and people always mix this up. Adam and Eve fell together. So according to the book of Genesis, Eve invites Adam to eat the forbidden fruit. It's not a sin that Eve committed alone. They committed it together. Uh, it's very clear. Uh, she gives some to her Adam, who's right next to her. In other words, they fell together. Eve cooperated with Adam, and Adam cooperated with Eve, so that neither one's actions are isolated from the other. So this explains why Adam and Eve suffer the effects of sin together. And God says, to the woman, I will greatly multiply the pain of your childbirth, and in pain you'll bring forth children. To the man, he says, in the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for it is out of that you are taken. You are dust, and to dust you shall return. And the last line echoes this warning that will happen if the man eats from the forbidden tree. You shall surely die. They do. They're driven out of the Garden of Eden, and the tree of life is lost. Um, it's not really God who drives them out. It's their own actions that drive them out. And this doesn't make any sense, but like the word shalom, we translate it as peace, and it is. But it really, it would be more accurately translated unity. So for you to have shalom, you need four unities. You need unity between you and other people. You need unity between you and God. You need unity within yourself. And you need unity with creation itself. If you have all four of those, then you have true shalom. So when Adam and Eve disobeyed, shalom was broken. They're no longer in union with them and God, not even union with themselves and each other or creation. So you could say, well, God drove them out of the Garden of Eden, kinda. But really the fact that they broke shalom, unity, there can't be paradise when there isn't any unity. Does that make sense? So it's their own actions that drove them out. Um, that's my only point. Um, but notice, it's done together. And then you have this talk about the battle between the serpent and the woman. Um, it's, so this is kind of important. The real culprit is the serpent. And it's also punished. Um, and uh, what makes this kind of mysterious is that on one hand, modern interpreters will say that uh, it's simply an origin about the uneasy relationship between us and rattlesnakes. But on the other hand, um, if you're ancient Jews, you saw this, an interpretation between the spiritual battle between human beings and the devil and his angels. Uh, ancient Jewish interpreters uh, always referred to this as a battle. So in the next chapter when it's talking about sin, it, uh, God says sin is like a beast lurking at the door, ready to strike, but you can master it. That's the part that people always... We can live in the Garden of Eden um, if we're truly united with God and each other. We can live where the uh, snake is in the garden, where the devil doesn't affect us. Uh, everybody's always looking for a place of paradise where we get rid of all the evil. If we are true human beings, we could stand before the presence of evil and not be seduced by it. 
Um, the, there's this oracle about this conflict between the woman's seed and the devil. Um, that he'll put enmity, hostility, between the serpent and the devil. There's going to be this war. Ezekiel talks about it. Numbers talks about it. Um, that there's going to be this fight. So all of Judaism was look. There's this prophecy from Genesis. And the prophecy is this. One day, um, from the, the seed of the woman will crush the head of the snake, uh, the devil. But the snake will give a death blow to the child. So they'll both end up killing each other. So Judaism, if you look at the entire Jewish history, it's waiting for this blessing. Uh, who is going to be the snake crusher? Does that make sense? Who's gonna, it means you're gonna die, but this person will crush evil itself. So if you can read the entire Old Testament of who's gonna be this blessing? And the whole line is traced to the blessing. So, uh, so it'll be a child of Eve, and then you'll know it'll be a child of Abraham. And then this is why um, uh, Jacob steals the blessing from his father, right? Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, steals it from his brother. And instead of giving it to Esau, Jacob steals it and gets it. And so modern readers will say, well, why, why can't you just give another blessing to Esau? No, the blessing has gone out. There's not going to be two snake crushers. There's going to be one. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And they're trying to trace who the line through. Now it's going to go to forever. It'll go through Jacob. It can't be given back to Esau. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And then from Jacob, it goes to, um, uh, keeps going to uh, Judah of the 12 brothers. It's not Joseph who gets a blessing. Oddly enough, it's Judah. That's where you get the name Jew. Um, and then it'll be from the line of David. So you keep seeing where the blessing, does that make sense? So what they're looking for is the prophecy of um, the child of Eve is gonna come and crush the head of the snake. He'll die, uh, the snake crusher will die, but he'll come. So also you have this fourth thing about um, Eve, Christ, and the ancient tradition. Um, granted, Genesis just says the serpent, but later on wisdom will say it's the devil. Um, uh, so there's all these other things um, that uh, it's the devil um, uh, Sirach is going to talk about from a woman sin had its beginning and because of that we all die or another writing says and think about what point I'm trying to make right now uh, the man transgressed my ways and was persuaded by his wife but she was deceived by the serpent and then death was ordained for the generations of men. Or fourth Ezra says, O oh Adam, what have you done? For it is, was you who sinned. The fall was not yours alone, but ours and our descendants. So around the time of Jesus, if you read all this, you have this widespread Jewish tradition that the fall of Adam and Eve just didn't affect them. It affected all human beings and their descendants. It's not personal guilt of sin, but it is a sin that we inherit. Do you know the name that we give that sin? Original. Yeah, good job. So it's original sin. It's like, like it's so many people, I was, when I was newly ordained priest, I was in Caldwell and this guy in the gym found out I was a priest and he wanted to chew me out and <laughs> like, I just want to do my traps. Um, and he said, well, you know, I just had a baby, and that baby is completely innocent. And how dare the Catholic Church say that my child has committed some sin? And I tried to tell him, well, that's, there's a difference between a baby hasn't committed personal sin, but was bro born into a broken world we call original sin. And he couldn't distinguish original sin from personal sin. Does that make sense? But think about this. If you look at the writings, that's what they believed. And... The prophecy is the ch about Christ and uh, Eve is that the serpent would be undone. Um, uh, so anyhow, uh, just skipping over this because I gotta speed up. So um, uh, um, anyhow, so there's all these prophecies that the child of the uh, Eve that will come that, that they're waiting for will not only crush the head of evil, but also um, 
do away with original sin. We'll have a way out of original sin. Jews don't use the term original sin that was later developed by us, but you already have the theological concept. So all that is just a large background to get to Mary, the new Eve. So in the New Testament, Mary's depicted as that is uh, both echoes the biblical portrait of Eve and the mysterious quote unquote woman of Revelation. Um, this happens in two places, two main places, in the Gospel of John and the book of Revelation. Um, in the Gospel of John, you have the wedding of Cana. You know the wedding of C Cana? Um, and first of all, it took place on the third day. Uh, that's what it says, right? But it really didn't. It actually happened on the seventh day. Because uh, you have to read the Gospel of John. It'll say um, uh, day, 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 four times. And then it'll say, then on the third day, after the fourth day. <laughs> so I'm not sure, but four plus three equals seven. Um, so it's the seventh day that Jesus at, is at the wedding of Cana. That's kind of important because the seventh day is a day of uh, creation, of new creation. Uh, that's the day Adam was created, the day Eve was created. The, day, the wedding day, the seventh day is the wedding between Adam and Eve. The seventh day is the day of the resurrection and the Eucharist that we share. Um, so John is depicting Jesus as the new Adam. And then you can say, well, why did he say the third day? Well, at that time period, it was this Jewish custom that you would get married on the third day um, because in the third day of creation is when God created water. And there is the only time where uh, God gives a double blessing, uh, good, good. And so if you just want to make sure you had a good wedding, uh, you'd try and get married on the third day. So John's trying to pick up Seventh day is the new creation. Jesus is the new Adam. But also third day, that's when a good wedding takes place. Does that make sense? So the third day of what? The third day after the fourth day. So, so three days after the fourth day. So he wants to work in the three because it has that idea of a wedding. Um, that's a, like, it sounds kind of strange. But so there's this ancient belief that it, if it rained on your wedding day, you're going to have a great wedding. Um, really? What's that? Wedding or marriage. Oh, sorry. A great marriage. Good good call. <laughs> Actually, swear to God, a couple of years ago, uh, I don't know if you guys remember this, it rained inside the church <laughs> yeah. guys, when the sprinklers went off. Yeah. And uh, that was just so funny. I mean, now it's funny. Um, it ruined the wedding, but they, we just went out into the courtyard and had the wedding in the courtyard, and they took their pictures with um, the firefighters. And, like, everything's ruined. So I said, well, did you want to try and reschedule? And like, no, let's just go outside and do it. We'll be talking about this for the next 50 years. I was like, good for you. Um, but here's, here's the most important part. So you have this new creation, seventh day, um, but in it, Jesus has this really weird language where even as a kid, I remember thinking, oh my God, that's weird because um, uh, they ran out of wine. And so Mary says, Mary's the one who starts it all. The same way Eve started it all, Mary's going to start it all, uh, except for good. And Mary says to Jesus, they have no wine. And Jesus has this really kind of snarky attitude <laughs> where he says, woman, how does your concern affect me? Um, like if you read it in English, you kind of think, wow, is he ticked off? <laughs> and so my joke is, you know, that could you imagine me as a little kid saying to my mother, if my mother said, clean your room, and I said, woman, <laughs> what, how does your concern affect me? It would affect me. Um, but why, why does he choose this language? Why does he choose this really odd language? Well, if you go back to that Adam and Eve story, remember, Eve's name is only called Eve outside the Garden of Eden. And only twice in the book of Genesis is she, is she called Eve. Eleven times she's called Isha, woman, or true human being. Um, so when Jesus says, uh, woman... And here's the thing, 
No one else in Scripture ever called their mother that name. You don't have any history of David or Abraham. It's Jesus who calls his mother, Isha, true human being. It's actually a compliment, not an insult. Does that make sense? And his hour, his hour, as you find out later, is when he's on the cross, when he dies, that's the true wedding feast, not Cana. The true wedding feast is when his side is split. Does that make sense? So uh, from the, and also, by the way, he does this again. At the, he starts off the Gospel of John by calling her Isha, a true human being. And on the cross, he calls her once again, woman, a true human being. Um, so you have that at the crucifixion. Um, and there's kind of uh, important things to notice that um, in the Gospel of John, Jesus describes his death on the cross as at the hour that the devil will be crushed. He's the uh, uh, head crusher. Um, so, so he says, now is the judgment, judgment on this world. So now the ruler of the world will be cast out. And, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all to myself. Um, so he's the one who's, remember, the, the, the serpent's going to kill the snake crusher, but the snake crusher will kill the serpent. Um, and so uh, he'll be defeated, but it'll also be uh, raised up. Also on the cross, you have this, but standing by the cross of Jesus was his mother and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing near, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your woman. And from that hour on, he took her as his own mother. Um, so this prophecy fulfills a prophecy that the child of the woman will crush the snake. It's all making this, if you know the New Testament, you'd think, oh, Mary is a true Eve. Um, then once again, if you look to the book of Revelation, in the book of Revelation, and I'm going to go over this next time too, um, Revelation, the sign of Mary is a new Eve. Because you open the book of Revelation, you have this woman clothed in the sun with 12 stars standing on the moon. Uh, well, what does she symbolize? We would say Mary. She symbolizes both Mary and the church. But we'd say both. Protestants would say, oh no, just the church. Well, that makes no sense. Because you have the devil, right? The dragon. And it says the dragon has uh, seven heads and ten crowns. And the dragon symbolizes all those who are persecuting the church. So if the dragon symbolizes both Satan and Satan's followers, why can't Mary also symbolize Mary and uh, uh, the church? Because it literally says she has other children, right? Um, and you have Christ, who the child symbolizes both Christ, but also symbolizes the body of Christ. So you have that kind of going on the whole time. So the sign, and I'll get into this next time, the sign is a woman. Uh, it doesn't say mother, it doesn't say Mary, it says a woman. The sign is a true human being. That's the new Eve. Or Paul in Galatians, he says, when it was time, when time had fully come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that they might be adopted as sons and daughters. Well, that's why he says that at the end. Why would Paul find it necessary to emphasize God's own son being born of a woman? We're pretty sure on how that biology works. Um, he's saying it more than just on the physical level that she was born from a woman. He's saying something deeper. He's speaking about, he's alluding to the Genesis, pro Genesis prophecy in chapter 3 about the new Eve that will give birth to the child. Does that make sense? Um, uh, it also gets into some adoption later, but um, that could only link, link Mary as the new Eve. Well, that says something about the Immaculate Conception. Um, so, from this view, Mary is the new Eve, and that's where we get our doctrine of the Immaculate Conception. Mary as the second Eve led to the realization that Mary, like uh, Eve herself, 
was created sinless. If Mary is really the new Eve, then she has to be greater than Eve. Because remember, the type in the Old Testament, uh, the type in the New Testament is greater than the type in the Old Testament. Um, Christ is greater than Abraham, Moses, David. The temple in heaven is greater than the temple on earth. The new Eve is going to be greater than the old Eve. So think about these. So you have this contrast between the old Eve and the new Eve. And there's all of these. So um, first, Adam. Christ is the new Adam, right? So Adam was created without sin. So was Christ in the New Testament. The first Eve was created without sin. Mary was conceived without sin. I'll get to that in a second then. But no, Mary was created without original sin. Um, through Eve, through the first Eve, sin entered the world. Through Mary, salvation entered the world. Eve said no to God. Mary said yes to God. Eve offered the fruit of good and evil. Mary's going to offer the fruit of of the tree of life, Christ. Eve disobeyed God. Mary obeyed God. Eve had pain in childbirth. We'll get into this later, but at Mary's childbirth, there is no pain. She's going to feel the pain of childbirth at the cross. Um, the first Eve uh, was approached by a fallen angel. The new Eve is approached by a good angel, Gabriel. The first Eve believed the lie rather than the truth. Mary believed the truth. The first Eve gave birth to death. The new Eve gave birth to life. Now, about what you said about, uh, well, so, well, you'd say, well, Mary, she was conceived with immaculate conception, means she was born without original sin. Where did the early Christians get this idea? And it's from what Gabriel says. So, um, if the first Eve was created without sin, then the new Eve, who's greater, has to be created without sin. Does that make sense? So, uh, you have this concept in Genesis 3 about the promise of the seed of the new woman who crushed the head of evil, but the child, there'll be enmity. Um, the child and the new Eve will not be put under the seed of the serpent. So, if the child and the new Eve won't be put under the seed of the serpent, Seed has a double meaning here in Hebrew. It can either mean a child, a seed, or it also means teaching. Um, so the new Eve won't be under the seed of Satan, won't be under the influence of um, Satan. She'll be untainted by sin. And that's the beginning of the Immaculate Conception. The Immaculate Conception is saying Mary is the new Eve, which means her son is the long-awaited snake crutcher. And think how Gabriel's uh, greeting to Mary was. Um, uh, when, it says, when he says, Hail Mary, full of grace, full means, um, the word full means that she says yes to every grace in every moment of her life. But the angel in Greek, what he says is, Mary, it's not translated well into English, but it was that when it says Mary, full of grace, um, it's Mary is, was, and will be full of grace. What do you mean was full of grace? And the early Christians would say, oh, Mary was full of grace from the moment of her conception. That from the moment of her, her conception, she wasn't under, in, under the influence of the seed of Satan, but the seed of her son. Um, so, like anti-Catholics will say, well, uh, Hail Mary, full of grace, is just a common greeting. No, it wasn't. Um, it, it wasn't a common greeting. Because think about this. Why would Mary say that she was troubled by the greeting of the angel if it was common? If saying hail full of grace is common, um, it's just to say, the anti-Catholics say, it's just say, uh, easy as saying hello. If I said hello to a lotus, she wouldn't say, well, what does he mean by that? <laughs> um, if it's so common, uh, the point being is if it's so common, why would Mary be, quote unquote, troubled by the angel's greeting if it's such a common way? Uh, also, the gospel literally says that she was troubled. It doesn't say she was troubled by the angel. She was troubled by the angel's greeting. Um, 
And when he says Mary full of grace, what he's doing is changing her name. Her name was Mary. Now her name is Mary full of grace. I know it doesn't come up. It's not just a title. It's a change. And remember, God, angels often change people's name. Jacob, when he meets the angel, the angel changes his name to Israel. Abra, Abram becomes Abraham. There's all these changes. Um, so Mary's name gets changed. Also, at the time period, so the greeting hail, that was actually only used for royalty. And there's no archaeological evidence that this greeting uh, was ever common. So the point being is this. When he says, Mary, hail Mary full of grace, you'd have to say, well, what do you mean she was graced and will be graced? And early Christians would say, oh, because she's the new Eve, she has to be greater than the old Eve. And if the old Eve was created without original sin, then Mary had to be created without original sin. Um, so we'd say, putting it real basically, the Immaculate Conception celebrates that Mary was baptized in the womb. And you could say, well, yeah, but Mary, you could say what you said. Mary w was born before Christ, but Christ is God. And Christ is timeless. He can work backwards in time as well as in front of time. And you say, well, where is that in the Bible? Think about what Paul says. Paul says, it was Christ who led you out of the, led the 12 tribes out of Egypt. Does that make sense? Um, Yahweh is beyond time. It was Christ who did that. It was Christ who baptized Mary in the womb. So that's where we get our notion of Mary as the new Eve, the Immaculate Conception. Does that make sense or did I lose people? Yes. Um, so no, um, I didn't say it was either a compliment or an insult. I said for a little kid listening to it, it sounds like an insult. Um, but for the hearers at the time period, it wouldn't sound like an insult. It would just sound weird. Like why would you say woman, Isha? Um, why would you say that? Well, theologically, what he's saying is she's the original human being the image of, the, of what an original human being should look like. It's a compliment. And he speaks about his hour. His hour is when Satan will be crushed. So it all makes sense if you have a very long view. But I'm sure most people just thought, well, that's a strange greeting. Is that in, used anywhere else in the Bible? Women? That's the only place. Was Mary ever understood when he was saying to her? Um, I would like to think so. <laughs> because um, the, one of the first signs of the Messiah is um, prophecies will, that there'll be an overflow of wine. So I think Mary did understand it. I think Mary knew she gave birth to the snake crusher. So when he says Isha, I think she knows, oh, a true human being. Um, so Rob says what he likes about the Cana story is... It, yes, it's a wedding, but remember it's a prefigurement of the cross. Let me just explain what he means by that. What is Jesus wearing at the Last Supper and at, to the cross? A wedding dress. A wear, what is he wearing when he's crucified? A crown. You wear, on the one day you would wear a cartoon as a lay person. A priest would wear it all the time. Uh, would, a wedding dress is on your wedding day. <laughs> There was actually wedding garments for males, too. And females, and wear, the only time you'd wear a crown in your life is the day you get married. So if you read the cross right, the cross is actually the true wedding free feast when the wine truly flows. So go ahead. So he's, what he's mentioning is that within the Gospel of John, you have all these typologies. The Gospel of John has all these um, signs, and all the signs... Um, point to the really big miracle, and that is the passion, the cross and death, death and resurrection. So um, not only do you have typology from the Old Testament to the New Testament, but even within the Gospels, you have typologies. So all the way through, he's talking about his hour. Through the Gospel of John, he's always talking about his hour. Then when he's on the cross, he said, this is my hour. Well, the hour becomes important because that's what we're waiting for, is when the child of the new Eve will crush, I'm just checking the donuts out, um, <laughs> will crush. So 
that woman, that language, woman, would clearly speak about, um, um, oh, good one here. Um, oh, anybody else have a comment? Yeah. So when we're okay, so she said, how do you defend Mary against Protestants when they say, well, um, she wasn't a virgin, is that what you're saying? Oh. I would fight it this way. One, do you believe the Bible? Because literally the word Greek of the prophecy, uh, the Greek word is virgin, as in no sex. Does that make sense? So that's, that's number one. No, but you could say, well, she wasn't a virgin. Then you're also saying that the prophecy is not correct. Um, so which part of the Bible are you going to deny? Your, your idea that she had sex before marriage or the Bible itself? That'd be my number one. Number two, yeah, it does say she hadn't had relationships with them, um, but you wouldn't have because, um, and this gets a little hard. There's three phases to a full wedding. So they're betrothed, and you could say engaged, but it doesn't, like engaged is not strong enough a verb. Because remember, technically, Joseph was going to divorce Mary. So they're technically married at that part, but they hadn't had relations. You don't have the relations until the final act of marriage. Does that make sense? So um, why would Joseph be considered, contemplate divorcing him for, does that make sense? Um, also, um, the angel says that she will conceive and have a child, and she says, how can this be? Like, she can't be that naive that she doesn't know where babies come from. Like if I said to, if I if I said to Patsy, imagine Patsy's going to get married, um, and I said, "Oh, you're going to conceive and have a baby," she would shrug that off. What woman getting married wouldn't think, "Well, at some point, I'm going to have a baby." Does that make sense? Um, and that gets into a whole other realm of, well, why would she think? How could that be? Since I have no relations, don't know, haven't had relationships. Does that make sense? So you're saying, well, scripture's wrong, and you're saying Joseph was wrong, and you're saying Mary was wrong. I mean, that's a lot of wrongs. Does that make any sense? Then there's this whole theology that she was a consecrated virgin, which, virgin, which I'm not going to get into, but yes, there were consecrated virgins. And the, their oblates of the Essene community had consecrated virgin, virgins. Um, it's actually in the Old Testament, too. You could have consecrated virgins. So you'd even be more shocked that a virgin, a consecrated virgin, um, would be with child. And you could say, well, why would a consecrated virgin get married? Yes, consecrated virgins could still get married. They just wouldn't have sex. And a lot of the, like Mary's Magnificat, where Mary and Joseph lived, were all connected to a scene's community. So even though we don't know for sure, and I'm, it really does seem like if you study it, Mary has, uses a lot of language, or the Gospels use a lot of language of a seen community of a consecrated virgin. Consecrated virgins would marry an older widower um, so they'd have somebody to take care of them, but uh, would remain a virgin. Does that make sense? So when it speaks about Jesus' brothers and sisters, there's actually no word for, for that in Hebrew. Um, you would use, there, there's no word for cousins or stepbrothers. There's just a word for brothers and sisters. So you could call your cousin your brother as well. Does that make sense? So anyhow, uh, you'd have to deny a lot of scripture to get to that point. Any other questions? Human. Just human. Human being. As differentiated from Eve. No, Eve is Eve 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 is only called Eve outside the Garden of Eden. Before that, they're called Ha Adam, earthling. It's only when you love to the point of death do you become a true human being. So technically Ish and Isha is not about being male or female. It's about the power to be in relationship. He calls her Isha. Um, she's called Isha, woman, uh, at Cana, at the cross, and in the book of Revelation. So if you're, 
Hebrew, you'd really kind of think, oh, that's, uh, that's, it, he, you'd, when you hear woman, like the Isha, you'd think, oh, he's calling her a true human being. Does that make sense? So, like, here's a, like, I love the image of Eve as a new, uh, I'm sorry, Mary as a new Eve. It picks up the whole snake crushing thing, but it also picks up, I know this sounds kind of strange, the idea of freedom. The Immaculate Conception is about freedom. Um, she was preserved from original sin so that she could be completely free. And free from what? Well, free from shame. Remember, it says uh, after Adam and Eve had sinned, they hid in the darkness because they were ashamed of themselves. Mary doesn't hide. Mary is completely free from shame. And even, you don't get it, but the title, Jesus, Son of Mary, that's an insult. Um, when they called Jesus, Son of Mary, they know there's something odd about his birth, that his parents had some, does that make sense? So you never call, I would never call you Rob, son of, what's your dad's name? Greggy? Grady. Grady? Oh, so I'd call him Rob, um, Rob's son of Grady. You'd call Jesus, Yeshua was his name, Yeshua ben Joseph. To call him Yeshua ben Mary is an insult. Does that make sense? Um, Mary seems to be completely free from shame. Um, she's completely free from ego. Um, the idea of the new Eve is the old Eve could be seduced by her ego. Mary is completely free from her ego, so she can give a complete yes. Um, so I love that idea of Mary as, well, really, the true human being is Christ. But Mary is the, the new Eve, the best personification that we would have to say, ah, oh, who's your best disciple? Who's the person who symbolizes freedom the most? Free from ego, shame, sin. It's the new Eve. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, I think we should have a discussion question, but I really can't think of a question. Um, but just, does that make sense when we say Mary is a new Eve and the Immaculate Conception? So um, Rob said, um, he asked the kids, he, he works with our junior high kids and with uh, his wife, who's much younger than him. Um, so he asked these young people, um, what do you? What would you have to say? What does the phrase I had to think what you said, full, "full of grace" really mean? Well, first of all, in Greek, just to let you know, it means open to every moment of grace, saying yes to every moment of grace. But then he said, "What would you have to change in your life to be full of grace?" And would it be worth it? And would it be worth it? Uh, like that's a really good. I, that's a great reflection because. You would really have to die to ego and shame and sin. Uh, you'd have to say no a lot to that uh, ego. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. The other thing, like, I, and this is just filler now, but I just, like, I love, I mentioned this before, I love um, the name Mary, because the name Mary, it's Miriam from the Old Testament. Um, do you mind if I just explain that? So Moses, remember you have all these types. Well, I, I should explain that next week. Yeah, I think I will. Um, no. That is a great question. We would not say righteousness is completely restored. We'd say we have a way out of original sin. Um, like, I can't say I'm righteous. I could say I'm becoming righteous. Does that make sense? I won't be fully righteous till I'm in heaven, till I go through purgatory. Now, technically, you don't, like, I know this sounds right. There's Catholic dogma and there's doctrine. Technically, purgatory is doctrine. So if you say, I don't believe in purgatory, I would say, well, that goes against Catholic doctrine. You're wrong. Um, <laughs> but you're still Catholic. Does that make sense? It's not a Catholic dogma. I myself love the idea of purgatory. Um, it makes such sense to me. In heaven, no unclean thing will be in heaven. So just get into the righteousness. In heaven, um, sorry, during my life, I'm trying to become more and more righteous by following the way of Christ. More united with other people, even united with myself. 
between me and God. Does that make sense? But I'm not going to get to complete righteousness until I get to purgatory, um, where all the little things I refuse to look at. Does that make sense? Then on the other side of purgatory, I'll be completely righteous. The evil, or shouldn't say that, let's say bad people, evil people, they're not even concerned about becoming righteous. They're concerned about the appearance of righteousness, what Jesus called self-righteousness. They're not concerned about righteousness. They're concerned about the appearance of righteousness. And so they will choose to hide in the darkness. They, w they won't step into the light of heaven, which means they'll never step into purgatory either. Does that make sense? Um, so Christ's death on the cross just... Opened the way. He, yeah, he restored a path for us to get to righteousness. Right. So to get to, remember, to get back into the Garden of Eden, to get back into the Garden of Eden, there's a cherub with a, a sword. And when John, in the book of Revelation, when John gets to go to heaven, first he sees Christ in the appearance of an angel. You usually think of Christ as a human being. This is the time, in the book of Revelation, Christ appears as a cherubim, um, a tetramorph, with a sword sticking out of his mouth, and flames in his eyes. The point being is that um, how, sorry, how you get back into the Garden of Eden is through Christ, through the way of self-sacrifice, of dying to your ego. Does that make sense? So um, that's what that little symbol means. Christ opened us the way. Uh, the cross is not the end point. It's the door into heaven. So I haven't achieved full righteousness, and I won't till I get through purgatory. Then I'll be in right relationship with other people. I like to think he went to purgatory, but he's still saying yes to God. He's still on the path. The other one says no. So, you know, I personally think everybody's going to go through purgatory except for children who die at birth. No, really, they, they've never said no to God. How could they go through purgatory? Um, Yeah, I don't think Mary would need to go through purgatory either. You're right. She's a true human being already. Kathy says she doesn't have to go through. Well, she's lived with you. <laughs> she's happy. We know he's kidding. Kind of. All right. Well, next time we'll cover Mary the new ark. Sure.